hello my dear students hope you guys are all doing good hope you guys are all perfectly fine so in this video i'm going to explain a detailed mano mtp series 2 for ca inter auditing so whatever mtp series 2 is there which has been given for ca inter audit so that i'm going to explain a detailed manner so as i've already told you in my 3.5 day strategy video the most important thing which you have to refer before you go for the examination is mtps two series of the mtps mtp1 as well as mtp2 which has been released for may 2000, may 2024 attempt along with that whatever rtp that has been released for may 2024 attempt that is compulsory without referring the mtps and rtps you shouldn't go for the examination so that i insisted a lot and when it comes to mtp series one that is already recorded and uploaded on youtube it is already there existing on the youtube so now i am recording mtp series two so whatever series 2 related mtp is there, that i am going to explain in a detailed manner but my humble suggestion guys see this mtp explanations and all are going to take somewhere around 1.5 hours of time so each mtp series since i go in a very detailed manner so it will take somewhere around one and a half hours of time but i would suggest you you try to solve the mtp on your own you try to look at the questions you try to refer to the answers on your own if at all you are getting stuck somewhere if you are if at all you are having any confusion if at all you are not able to understand the answer given in the ICA, then only refer my video so that is my humble suggestion why because see if you take like mtp1 it might not take uh, one and a half hour you might not spend it so you could if you read it on your own if you are if you are having good knowledge of the concepts if you remember the topics and all you can read the mtp and solve the mtp on your own in half an hour of time so i'm not asking you to refer everybody this video but i am requesting you each and everyone to solve the mtp on your own if at all you are getting stuck somewhere if you are unable to understand some question if you are unable to agree with the answer given in the ICA suggested answers of the mtp then only you come to this uh, mtp and watch the explanation but whatever it is definitely you have to read the mtp so that is one suggestion from my side so having said that now i now i will directly go into the explanation part so first as we all know first case scenario based mcqs will be there let us try to start with the case scenario based mcqs so I'm starting with uh, case scenario number one. Let me let me try to read it. Let me try to read the facts. As I always say, if you are reading the case scenario based MCQs, the most important thing what you have to do is whenever you are reading the facts of the case scenario, you have to highlight the important terms. You have to highlight the key terms or at least try to prepare a summary of the facts, whatever you have understood from that case scenario so that you you will you can save the time of uh, reading the scenario again and again to understand the facts. So at the time of giving the first reading only try to make out all the facts at one place. All the key points all the important points you have to make a summary or you have to highlight it somewhere in the question so let us try to proceed further right. pluto limited is engaged in manufacturing and distribution of ergonomic furniture such kind of customizable range home office furniture has gained a lot of importance in the past few years the company was able to perform well over the years and the same is reflected in their financial years is there any key takeaway from this paragraph nothing they have simply told about certain company what business they are doing how they are performing next one during the year 23 24 so during the financial year 23 24 the audit firm sj and associates the name of the audit firm is sj and associates was reappointed so they are reappointed as their auditor the engagement team consisted of cs neha engagement partner and other members in the engagement team are five article assistants one of the assistants was new to this engagement Considering huge volume of transactions, the partner asked him to go through the files of the last year and the auditor's report to gain an understanding of the issues which arose in the last year, that is 2020-23. So, in the engagement team, one of the article assistants is very new. So, he is new to the audit. So, that's why what the engagement partner says today is please go through the last year's working papers and also please go through last year's auditor's report. Okay. While going through summary page of file of last year, he noticed that below points were under discussion with the partner before audit finalization. So when he gone through the last year's audit working papers, he found out some important points which were discussed in the previous audit. Point number one, for employee benefit expenses, following points were verified by the team. So when it comes to employee benefit expenses, the following things are verified. What are they? The employee benefit expenses shown in the books were actually incurred. So he found out that the last year's team has verified that employee benefits, whatever has been shown in the books, have they really incurred during the relevant period. So what assertion it is guys whatever expense that has been shown whether it has actually occurred or not what assertion it is so what assertion they are trying to verify they are trying to verify occurrence assertion from this point next one the expense is in respect of all personnel were accounted for what assertion it is whether all expenses relating to all employees have been recorded or not what assertion it is completeness so this is a completeness assertion okay they are trying to verify completeness the expense recognized during the year related to this year only whatever expense that has been recognized that belongs to current year only what assertion it is cut off assertion right so last year's audit team has performed these procedures and by performing these procedures this is what they are trying to establish these are the assertions which they are trying to verify okay perfect now let us come to the second point 
it was noted that divide, uh, dividend to equity shareholders for the year 2023 was declared on 15th of april 15th of april 2023 for the financial year 2022-23 for this year the dividend was declared on 15th of april 2023 you tell me when the provision for when the dividend has to be recognized in the books of accounts see dividend is related to this year but it was declared on 15th of april of 23 that means it was declared in the financial year 23 24 but the dividend was related to 22 23 year in which year it has to be recognized accounting standards say dividend has to be recognized only when the right to receive the dividend has been established and that right to receive the dividend will be established only when it is declared so the dividend should be recognized the provision for dividend should be created in the year 50, in the financial year 23 24 though it might be related to the financial year 22 23 but since it was declared on 15th of april 23 it should be recognized in the financial year 23 24 but however in the notes to accounts they have to give a disclosure for the financial year 22 23 they will not create any provision for dividend but in the notes to accounts they have to give a disclosure they have to add one note that the dividend so and so amount of dividend has been declared but actual provision will come in which year 23 24 the year of declaration will be the date in, in will be the year in which it has to be recognized okay as a dividend related to the year 20 to 23 the same was recognized as a liability in the same year is it correct no it should not be recognized it should not be recognized in the financial year 20 to 20, 23 it should be recognized in the year 23 24 year of declaration because then the right to do right to receive the dividend will be established next third point debtors constitute one of the major components of the company's financials as a part of audit procedure verification was made whether the company has made elements for these debtors which were doubtful so the auditor was verifying the debtors while verifying the debtors he was verifying whether the company has created a proper provision whether the company has calculated a correct provision for bad and doubtful debts in this regard list of debtors under litigation was also obtained see when the auditor is checking what whether the amount whether correct amount of provision has been created or not if the auditor is trying to check that what assertion he is trying to establish valuation whether debtors amount is correct or not the valuation the figure at which the debtors is stated is correct or not that's what he is trying to verify now by checking the amount of the provision so if you are trying to obtain audit evidence regarding the amounts and figures with respect to balance sheet items what do we call that assertion as valuation so by verifying the calculation of the provisions he is trying to establish the valuation assertion good next one point number four assets uh, asset additions during the year amounted to 50 lakhs that means during the year the company has acquired the assets of 50 lakh rupees the payment of the the payment in respect of these assets were made through bank account of the company however on scrutiny it was found that some of the invoices were not in the name of the company but in name of the directors so when you are verifying certain assets you uh, in order to check the ownership in order to check the rights you will try to verify supporting documents see if it is landed buildings we try to verify support uh, title deeds if it is vehicles we try to verify rc registration certificates sir what about other assets when it come to other assets how can we verify the ownership the simple thing what we can do is invoice in that cases we have to check the invoices and we have to check in the invoice the name of the company is there or not so by checking the invoices you try to establish the rights and obligations assertion by checking the invoices you are trying to establish whether the company is a true owner of the assets or not but it was found that when you verified some invoices of the assets in the invoices the name of the company is not their name of the directors is there so that means here the company might not be having the proper rights they are not the owners of that assets why because in the invoice company's name is not their directors names is there so the auditor is trying to establish rights and obligations but that is not uh, but that is not correct rights are not there for the company because invoices are not there in the name of the company next one the company was maintaining few bank accounts including one foreign currency account there was included in the previous year a file of paper converting foreign currency amount held in a bank to indian rupees at the closing exchange rate so last year the the company is having a foreign currency account they're having they're having a account foreign bank account they're having in that foreign bank account they have a uh, they have a uh, foreign currency will be there so you tell me if the company is having a foreign currency foreign bank account so as per as 11 this amount is required to be converted using indian exchange rate as on the date of balance sheet or not yes the same thing they are telling there was included in the previous year file a paper converting the foreign currency amount held in bank account to indian rupees yes the foreign currency has to be restated into indian rupees as the as per the closing rate which standard says that as 11 says that okay so these are the observations when going through the last year's audit file these are the observations which engagement team partner with engagement team member had now on the basis of these facts they are asking the question let us try to answer them in point one relating to employee benefits which among the following assertions are discussed respectively so they are telling in uh, point number one three assertions we have verified now in the first point occurrence second point completeness third point cutoff this order only they are asking us to identify 
so they're asking us to verify they're asking us to find out the order of assertions which are verified so they're giving options valuation occurrence cutoff completeness what is the correct order guys so correct order is occurrence first completeness second and cutoff third so occurrence this is the first one this is the first then completeness then cutoff this is the third so correct order should be two four and three so two four and three so this is going to be the correct option next one do you think the amount of dividend recognized as liability in the year 2022-23 as given in point two is it appropriate see the company created a provision in the year created a liability in the 22-23 year only is it correct no they should not create provision in the year 22-23 they should have created a liability in the year 23-24 but disclosure is required in the year 22-23 so option a is telling it is correct no it is not correct no the amount should be recognized equally between two financial years no such provision users bullshit thing they are telling no, the amount should not be recognized in the year 22-23, but it needed to be disclosed in the notes of that year. Yes, this is correct. The provision should, the liability should not have been created in the year 22-23, but notes should have, disclosure in the notes to accounts is required. No, the amount should not be recognized as liability. Further, no disclosure is also needed. No, no, you have to give the disclosure. So, option C is the correct option. Next one. In relation to matter described in para 3, pertaining to debtors, which of the following assertion was verified by the auditor? So, I told you that the auditor is trying to check the amount of the provision for bad and doubtful debts. That means what assertion he is trying to establish? Valuation. This I have already explained in the question itself. Read point 4 and choose which assertion is not provided. What is point 4? Checking of the invoices of the fixed assets. So, when the auditor verified the invoices of the fixed assets, in that he was able to find that the name of the company is not there, name of the directors is there. So, which assertion was not uh, proved here? So, which assertion is not proved? Rights and obligations. Nothing but we can also say it other way around as ownership. Rights meant ownership only. Ownership is not there. So, rights and obligations is not proved here. Next one. Choose the correct statement from below pertaining to the matter described in point 5. Point 5 is talking about that foreign bank account now. So, foreign bank, whatever amount that you are having in the foreign bank account, is it required to be converted into Indian currency? Yes. As per AS11. The company was required to restate said amount in accordance with requirements of AS1, not AS1, AS11. The company was required to restate said amount in accordance with the requirements of AS11. By verifying it, auditor has verified completeness. No, if you are checking that calculation, conversion from Indian currency to foreign foreign currency to Indian currency, when you are checking that calculation, actually, yeah, when you are trying to verify that, you are actually trying to check the calculation. When you are trying to check the calculation, that is valuation. You are trying to check whether the value of the foreign currency is correctly stated in the balance sheet or not. So that is a valuation assertion, not the completeness assertion. So the company was required to restate it. This is correct. But by verifying it, they are verifying completeness. No, that is not completeness. There was no responsibility of the company to restate said amount. No, no, they have to restate this amount. The company was required to restate said amount in accordance with the requirements of AS11. By verifying it, auditor has verified a valuation assertion. Yes, he is trying to verify whether the amount is correct or not. That only we call it as a valuation assertion. So option D is going to be the correct option. Clear? Everybody able to understand till here? So we are done with one case scenario based MCQ. I hope everybody is clear. This is how you have to read and interpret the questions. Understood? Now, coming to the case scenario number two, we will try to understand the next case scenario also in the same way, like the way I have read the case scenario number one, understanding each and every paragraph, making out the important facts. This is how this kind of reading methodology you have to develop. So let me read the case scenario number two here. Watch IT India Private Limited is a company engaged in the business of manufacturing smartwatches. The company had a slow start in the beginning as the company's products were gaining traction with the customers. However, momentum has picked up during the year. So at the beginning, the company was not doing such a great business because it is promoting its product. But over a period of time, the business has expanded. How, uh, yeah, The company wants to appoint Mrs. Tripathi and Associates, a CA firm as the auditors for the financial year 2023-24. By replacing their existing auditors, Mrs. Shripath and Co. Nothing but Shripath and Co. are outgoing auditors. They are retiring. They are retiring auditors. So the company is removing this Shripath and Co. auditors. And this Tripathi and Associates is incoming auditor. So they are replacing the retiring auditor. Okay. All right. So they are incoming auditors. Shripath and Co. are retiring auditors. Very good. Tripathi and Associates are willing to accept the engagement. They communicated with the previous auditor before accepting the engagement. One of the preliminary engagement activities. One of the preliminary engagement activities, if you remember, communicating with the previous auditor. The same thing they are telling. So, this incoming auditor has communicated with the previous auditor. So, they communicated with the previous auditor before accepting the engagement. However, Shripath and Co. have failed to respond. So, this incoming auditor, they fulfilled their responsibility. They communicated with the previous auditor. Who is the previous auditor? Shripath and Co. So, it is his professional responsibility to respond back to that incoming auditor. See, incoming auditor sent you a 
communication sir i'm going to accept this company's audit previously you are the auditor do you have any objections it is also a requirement of the professional ethics actually more you will learn it at the cfn level but just i will tell you in brief so here incoming auditor is required to communicate with the previous auditor so without the incoming auditor's fault he sent a uh, in without the incoming auditor's fault he sent a communication to the retiring auditor it is his professional responsibility he should have responded but here what is happening previous auditor did not respond that means he is not behaving in a proper manner he is not responding as per requirements of the law so he is while it he is not uh, he is negligent actually he is not responding okay this is the summary of the first paragraph now let us come to the second paragraph ca kishan partner of tripathi and associate explained his team members about importance of the engagement letter okay he also arranged a team discussion on the matters relating to acceptance of the terms of engagement so engagement partner has told his engagement team members about the importance of the engagement letter they also had a discussion regarding terms of the engagement very good next one first point of consideration was concerning preconditions for an audit preconditions for an audit what is the other name for preconditions of an audit management responsibilities so what are the management responsibilities what are the preconditions which you have to confirm management is responsible for preparation of financial statements that too as per applicable financial reporting framework they are also responsible for designing and implementation of internal controls they have to provide the auditor with access to all records any extra explanation which auditor may require and also the management has to provide unrestricted access to persons within the organization these are preconditions which you have learned in the chapter nature objective and scope of audit right. now let us see so mr arun a team member could recollect few of them so there are preconditions these are the list of preconditions out of that one of the engagement team member was only able to recollect a few of the preconditions not all those included determining whether the financial reporting framework used in the preparation of financial statements is acceptable so that is one thing which he thought one of the precondition one of the precondition is checking whether the whether the applicable financial reporting framework adopted by the management is acceptable or not next one management providing auditor with access to all relevant information and additional information upon auditor's request it was further elaborated by arun that management has to provide unrestricted access to employees within the entity as may be required by the auditor for obtaining audit evidence so out of the out of the preconditions the the engagement team member was able to recollect only this part out of the preconditions the engagement uh, the engagement team member was able to recollect only this part whether uh, it is the responsibility of management to provide access to all records to provide extra information and also to provide unrestricted access to the persons he was unable to recollect these two things what are the two things which he is unable to recollect whether the, uh, it is the responsibility of the management to prepare the financial statements as per the requirements of the applicable financial reporting framework and also to design and implement internal controls these two he is unable to recollect but only providing access to all records checking whether uh, providing extra information unrestricted access to persons this only he was able to recollect as a preconditions now coming to the next part team members were asked to list factors that may necessitate revision of the engagement term engagement letter in terms of recurring audit so if you remember in the nature objective and scope of audit we have understood a concept of recurring audit and when engagement letters required to be given in the case of recurring audit we have seen so generally when there is change when there are some changes happening then even though it is a recurring audit it is highly advisable to give the engagement letter once again so team members were asked to list factors that may necessitate revision of engagement letter in the case of recurring audits mr kumar another team member replied that revision may be required in the following cases what are the significant changes in ownership yes in this case is the in this case is the requirement of issuing engagement letter in the case of recurring audit is required yes recent changes in the senior management yes this is also a valid case where you are required to send the engagement letter once again even though it is a recurring audit changes in the financial reporting framework yes if there is any change in the financial reporting framework then also it is better to issue an engagement letter once again modest changes in the nature of the size of entity this is not the correct one see when there are significant changes when there are major changes in the nature or size of the entity's business then you are required to issue an engagement letter once again but here in the question they are telling modest changes very minimal changes are there in the client's nature or size of the business so only when there are very huge changes happened in the nature of business size of the nature of the business client's business size of the entity's business then only we are required to issue an engagement letter once again but here in the given case they are telling modest changes what is the modest changes what is the meaning of modest changes very minimal changes have taken place with regard to the nature of the client's business and size so in that case is there any requirement to issue an engagement letter once again generally not required only when significant changes have taken place then only required change in the legal and regulatory requirement and this is also a valid reason in which you are required to issue an engagement letter once again so out of these things out of these factors which is not the reason for issuing engagement letter once again in the case of recurring audit this one modest changes in the nature or size of the entity's business when significant changes are there you are supposed to give but modest changes not required next one mr ram one of the team members raised it out 
he inquired regarding recourse available to incoming auditor in case management makes it clear before acceptance of engagement engagement by auditor regarding its inability to provide to support him in respect of certain procedures expected to be performed during the course of audit i will tell you simply in a simple manner i will take so one of the in a simple manner i will say one of the engagement team member mr ram he is asking he is inquiring what will be the course of action in case if the management is telling you even before you accept the audit that they will not provide you some evidence what you should do you will understand he inquired regarding recourse available to incoming auditor in case management makes it clear before acceptance of engagement very important before acceptance of engagement only if the management is telling you clearly that it's an it's inability to providing support to him that means before accepting the audit only if the management is telling that they will not provide you sufficient information then what you will do if you remember one small question i have explained in the nature objective and scope of audit if the management is imposing a limitation of work even before you accept the audit what you are supposed to do don't accept the audit only if the management is putting a restriction even before you say accept before you accept the audit only if they are putting a limitation on the scope what you are supposed to do don't accept the audit only that is what the course that is what the course of action which auditor should do clear in this respect specific question was raised relating to sending of confirmation request to the material trade payables reflected in the financial statements of a company so management uh, auditor wants to send a confirmation request to the trade payables trade payables pertain to material input and input services acquired and utilized by the company during the year so these trade payables have arisen because of inputs and input services lack of support by management in such a case would in in effect signify management's refusal to allow the auditor to send a confirmation request to the at the outset even before engagement is accepted by the auditor that means here it is clear that management is management is telling we will not permit you to send the confirmation request with the trade payables and they put this condition even before you accepted the audit the management is coming to you and telling boss if you want to send external confirmation to, to the trade payables we will not do it we will not permit you to send the confirmation request to the trade payables this they have told it even before you accept the audit what you will do so here management is putting a restriction even before you accept the audit what you should do don't accept the audit only don't accept the audit only this is what we have seen in the nature objective and scope of audit so these are the important facts now out of this facts they are asking us to answer the questions let us read the questions now as regards doubt of mr ram described in the last para of case scenario which of the following statements is likely to be in accordance with the standards on audit see they are first talking about the last paragraph so management is not permitting the auditor to send a confirmation request to the trade payables this they have told it even before accepting the audit what you should do don't accept the audit engagement only the auditor needs to inquire into management's refusal for the refusal and perform alternative audit procedures this in case after accepting the audit at the, at the time of accepting the audit they did not put any restriction after accepting the audit if the management is refusing then you will do this then you will inquire the reasons then you will uh, perform alternative audit procedures the auditor needs to evaluate implication of management refusal on auditor's assessment of risk of material misstatement and perform alternative audit procedures see this also after accepting the audit if the management put restriction then you will do these two things but here in the given case they are putting a restriction even before engagement is accepted so the third option the auditor should not accept such an engagement this is a correct option since you came to know it before accepting the audit only don't accept such audit engagement only the auditor needs to evaluate implications of management refusal on the fraud and perform alternate audit procedures this is also something which will happen after accepting the audit if the management is put, management is putting a restriction but here it is clearly told even before accepting the audit management is putting a restriction you should not accept the audit only so option c is the correct option next one when ca kishan when ca kishan the partner asked about preconditions for an audit mr arun mr arun could recollect only few of them read the passage and find out which among the following points were missed i have already told you two points are missed that the management is responsible for preparation of financial statements that to as per applicable financial reporting framework management is responsible for designing and implementation of internal controls these two are missing they are asking us to find out these two things only so which of the following points are missed Mani uh, obtaining management responsibility on specific legal aspects no we need not obtain this is not a precondition obtaining management responsibility on standards on audit no standards on audit is something which auditor has to worry about not the management so this is also not the thing sorry why it is behaving like this okay next one obtaining management responsibility for the preparation of financial statements as per applicable financial reporting framework yes this is one of the precondition obtaining management responsibility on necessary internal controls to enabling preparation of financial statements which are free from material misstatement yes this is also management responsibility so which are which uh, preconditions are missed three and four these two are missed next one 
From what Mr. Kumar has replied about the factors requiring a revision of engagement letter, one point was incorrect. Which point was incorrect? Out of the options given, out of the factors which one of the engagement team member told, which is not a reason for giving engagement letter in the case of recurring audit, modest changes in the nature and size of the business. So that is the correct option. This is not the reason for issuing an engagement letter once again in the case of recurring audit. So option B. Next, Shripath and Co. have failed to respond to incoming auditors. In this regard, choose the most appropriate action. So as we have seen, the incoming auditor who is uh, the incoming auditor who is three party and associates they communicated with the previous auditor but it was the responsibility of the previous auditor to respond back but he is not responding so this indicates that the, the outgoing auditor was negligent so let us see the options what they are telling it was unethical on the part of outgoing auditors for failing to respond to the communication made by internal audit made by incoming auditors yes by not communicating with the incoming audit by not responding back to the incoming auditors you are unethical it is a violation of principle of objectivity. No. See, we have five ethical requirements. What are they? Integrity, objectivity, confidentiality, professional competence and due care, and professional behavior. Sir, what is integrity? Remaining honest and sincere, straightforward. Sir, what is objectivity? Unbiasedness. Sir, what is confidentiality? Maintaining secrecy. Professional competence and due care. That means what? You have to remain competent. You have to remain capable. Update your skills and all. Professional behavior, that means you have to behave as per the laws and regulations. You should not do anything which brings a disrepute to the profession. So it was unethical. So if the audit, if the outgoing auditor did not communicate, did not respond back to the incoming auditor, yes, he is unethical. But is it violating objectivity? Is it leading uh, because of doing that? Was he doing, was he of bias? No. So it is unethical agreed, but it has nothing to do with the objectivity principle. Objectivity is something relating to unbiasedness. Next one. It was ethical on part of outgoing orders. I am not reading it further. Why? Because it, has, it was unethical. So this option is completely out. It was unethical on the part of outgoing auditor for failing to respond communication made by incoming auditors. Yes, it is a violation of principle of professional competence and due care. This is also incorrect. It is not related to professional competence. Professional competence means what? Remaining capable. That means you have to update your skills and knowledge. If you did not communicate, if you did not respond to the previous auditor, are you, if you did not respond back to the incoming auditor, are you not remaining capable? Are you not uh, remain? Are you not updating proper skills? See, this has nothing to do with the skills actually. So it is, this is also half correct, but it is not a violation of professional competence. Next one. It was unethical on the part of outgoing auditors for failing to respond to the communication made by incoming auditors. It is a violation of principle of professional behavior. Yes, you are not behaving appropriately. You are not doing your work as per laws and regulations. You are doing something which brings a disrepute to the profession. By not responding with the incoming auditor, yes, you are, you are behaving in a wrong manner. Your behavior is not correct. So it is violating the professional behavior fundamental principle. So this is the correct option. Option D is going to be the correct option. Able to understand everybody? Now coming to the case scenario number three. So let us try to understand the third case scenario. See in this MTP three case scenarios are that there are no general MCQs. Everything is a case scenario based question. In accordance with the requirements of standards on auditing, CA Tina, a freshly qualified professional, wants to obtain sufficient and appropriate audit evidence in an audit engagement pertaining to financial statements of a partnership firm for the year 2020 to 23. So CA Tina, a freshly qualified professional, she wants to obtain sufficient and appropriate audit evidence related to the financial statements of a partnership firm. Okay, the firm is trading in FMCG goods. Appointed in May 2023. When she was appointed, she was appointed in the May 2023. That means for the financial year 2022-23, she was appointed on May 2023. That means after the closure of the financial year, she was appointed or before the closure of the year. After the financial year has closed, after the relevant financial year has closed, after the close of the financial year, she was appointed. Okay. Appointed in May 2023, she needs evidence to obtain information arriving at her judgment. Clearly remembering fundamentals that an auditor has to obtain sufficient and appropriate audit evidence to draw reasonable conclusions on the financial statements, she proceeded in accordance with the audit plan prepared by her. Okay, She has understood the fundamental concepts of the audit and she has prepared the audit plan and she wants to prepare perform the audit procedures as per the plan. During the year 2022-23, the firm was maintaining a current account with a branch of a public sector bank. Her audit plan had included procedures of conforming balances of the current account directly from the bank. So one of the audit procedures, she wants to obtain audit evidence regarding bank balances. One of the procedures was to obtain the confirmation from the bank. As of 28th of March 2023, the firm had an urgent need to pay its utility bill amounting to 1 lakh. So as on 28th of March 23, the company is having one has to pay one important bill of 1 lakh rupees. However, due to insufficiency of funds, it has requested branch manager to get a check drawn on utility company cleared. Even though there is no balance, the company has requested the branch manager and they convinced him, sir, you please clear the check, later we will pay it. 
So here there is a lapse here actually. So the company has requested, the, the firm was able to convince the branch manager even though there are no funds, sir clear the check now, we will pay that money later. That means they might have some close relationship with the bank manager. Generally these kind of things will not happen in the real world but just for the question, of, for the sake of question they have told us. So company, the client was able to influence the bank manager and get the amount cleared even though there is no sufficient balance in the current account they cleared it and uh, as a result of which the current account balance has gone into negative that's what they say here however due to insufficiency of funds it has requested the branch manager to get the check drawn on utility company cleared therefore balance in the current account of the firm in the books of in the books of bank bank branch stood at 0.92 lakhs debit balance okay so because of this what happened is so the company has gone into negative so in the bank in the bank statement it, if it was debit balance that would be a credit balance in the current account you have a credit balance of 92,000 0.92 lakhs okay that means even no sufficient funds are there but still the branch manager was able to clear it so how you have to show this 0.92 see there will be debit balance generally in the balance sheet we have cash and cash equivalents we show the cash and cash equivalents when there is a positive balance of cash and cash equivalents but in the current case, there is a negative balance in the bank statement. How we have to show it? Sir, can I show under cash and cash equivalents a negative balance in the assets side? No, you should not show it. You have to show it as a current liability. You have to repay it in the near future? No. So the correct accounting presentation will be show it as a current liability. You can't show negative balance in the asset side under cash and cash equivalents. You have to show it as a current liability. Next one. The firm has also the firm had also issued checks in evening of uh, on the evening of 31st of March 2023 in anticipation of funds on the next working day. So they have issued some checks as on the evening of 31st of March 2023 and assuming that these checks will be presented later that is the next working day is 3rd of April they have an assumption that okay today we will issue the checks but the customer will go to bank on 3rd by 3rd of April we will get the funds into our bank account. It had also certain checks dated 27th of March 2023 from its debtors lying with it which were also deposited in the afternoon of 31st of March 2023 in the bank branch at the request of the debtors. Even they have some checks they have received also they have also deposited that checks as on 31st of March 2023. Okay. Her plan also included performance of certain procedures relating to verification of inventors. She also wanted to perform audit procedures to obtain audit evidence regarding inventors. Inventories of FMCG goods were material to the financial statements. Her assistant Tisha had her own notion about understanding of sufficient appropriate audit evidence. So one of the article assistants, she is having her own understanding regarding what is sufficient and appropriate audit evidence. She further feels that when audit evidence is obtained from available records of an entity, it is known as internal evidence. So she assumed that whatever evidence that is available internally, that is generated within the organization, that is internal evidence. But what is her understanding? She is assuming that whatever is available in the records, that is internal evidence. No, whatever evidence that is generated within the entity, that is internal evidence. Like purchase bills of FMCG, purchase invoices of FMCG, is it internal evidence or external evidence? Purchase invoice will always be external evidence purchase invoice will be generated outside of the client's organization when you go and buy the item the supplier will give the purchase invoice so purchase invoice is an external evidence not an internal evidence her understanding is wrong purchase invoice is an external evidence so debit notes issued by the firm on debtors for gst short charged earlier during the year as if if your firm if your client is giving the debit notes or if your client is issuing the credit notes which are generated your client is issuing debit notes your client is issuing credit notes will they be internal evidences yes they will be internal evidences next one she is also of the view that audit evidence obtained by the auditor is final and conclusive which is wrong the audit evidence obtained by the auditor should be persuasive it is convincing it is not conclusive the evidence obtained by the auditor is persuasive but not conclusive audit evidence can never be conclusive it should be only persuasive it should be only convincing evidence so these are the facts of the case on the basis of this they are asking a few mcqs let us try to answer them as regards matter of balance in current account and related issues is concerned which of the following statements is most likely to be appropriate let us see so there is a negative balance of 0.92 lakhs in the bank account no regarding that they are asking us to choose which option is correct amount of 0.92 lakhs is required to be classified under cash and bank balances no you it cannot show negative balance under cash and bank balances so first option is correct i'm not reading late further part uh, by here only i came to know that is wrong amount of 0.92 lakhs is required to be classified under cash and cash and bank balances okay this option is also wrong i'm not reading any further amount of 0.92 lakhs is required to be classified under current liabilities very good now we will read further so amount of 0.92 lakhs is required to be classified under current liabilities in the financial statements of the firm. Procedure of conforming balance directly from the bank alone is likely to constitute sufficient and appropriate audit evidence. They are telling that if you obtain external confirmation, if you obtain confirmation from the bank, that only will constitute, that alone audit evidence will be enough. 
in this given case it is not why because if you could see if you could pay attention the management of the firm the management of the client is able to convince the banker to clear the amount even though there are no sufficient funds so this clearly shows that the, the, the bank manager might not be independent person so that's why in that's why in this case external confirmation alone will not be giving you sufficient and appropriate audit evidence you should perform other procedures also so generally external confirmation will give you evidence but in case if the third party is not independent then you should not rely even on external confirmation you should perform other procedures also that is what happening in the given case yes half of the answer is correct you are required to show that under current liability but the other half they are telling that obtaining confirmation alone will be sufficient and appropriate audit evidence that will not apply in the given case next one amount of 0.92 lakhs so this is also correct because of the other half amount of 0.92 lakhs is required to be classified under current liabilities in the financial statements of the firm procedure of obtaining confirming balance directly from the bank alone is not likely to constitute appropriate audit evidence so it alone will not give you audit evidence you have to perform alternative procedures as well clear able to understand with this answer now coming to the next question considering matter of verification of inventories which of the following statements is based on the facts determined in the situation and also in assist of the standards So they are telling uh, in the in the case scenario they have told the auditor wants to obtain audit evidence regarding inventories also. So regarding that inventories they are giving some options regarding obtaining of audit evidence regarding inventories they are giving some options we have to choose the correct option. What are they? She should verify subsequent sale invoices of inventories items lying in the stock as at year end. Beside she should also review stock records of the year 2020-23 and subsequent period. Such evidence may constitute sufficient and appropriate audit evidence. Guys if you pay careful attention. The audit was getting conducted for the financial year 22-23 but the auditor was appointed in the month of may 2023 the generally stock verification will happen as on the date of balance sheet date 31st of march 2023 stock verification would have happened now tell me in the given case will it be possible for the auditor to attend that inventory verification no. why because she was appointed after the end of the balance sheet date yes or no so she was unable to perform audit she will not be able to perform she will not be able to attend the inventory counting as on the balance sheet date because she was appointed after the end of the financial year so one thing is very clear here she cannot attend the inventory verification then how she can obtain audit evidence she can perform alternative audit procedures like verifying the subsequent sale invoices and also verifying the stock records so this you can do to obtain audit evidence okay this looks correct but anyhow let us read the other options also she should verify subsequent sale invoices of the inventory items lying in the stock as at year end. Besides, she should also review stock records of year 2022-23 and subsequent period. She should attend physical inventory count at the year end. How she can attend? How she can attend the inventory counting at the year end? Year after the closure of the year, she was appointed in the May 2023. She cannot attend the inventory counting in the given case. So this option is not suitable. She should verify purchase invoices of the inventory items lying in stock as at the year end. Stock records are not required to be verified. No, no, stock records are required to be verified. So I'm not reading this option also. She should verify purchase invoices of the inventory items lying in stock as at the year end. She should attend inventory counting at the year end. No, she cannot attend the inventory counting at the year end. Why? Because she was appointed after the close of the financial year. So this option is also not correct. So what will be the correct option? So if we uh, read the options and if we find out what is a suitable option, option A is going to be the most suitable option. Next one. Identify the correct statement on the basis of description provided in the case scenario. Now this is regarding that internal evidence part. Purchase bills of FMCG goods, debit notes issued by the firm, credit notes issued by the firm are all, uh, are all examples of internal evidences. No, that is not correct. Why? Because purchase invoice is an external evidence. Debit notes and credit notes issued by the firm are internal evidences. But here in the option they are telling all are examples of internal evidences which is absolutely wrong. Next one. Purchase bills of FMCG goods, debit notes issued by the firm on debtors for GST charge and credit notes issued by the firm are all examples of internal evidence. Audit evidence obtained by auditor is persuasive. No, I'm also not agreeing with that because they are telling all examples, all are examples of internal evidences, which is not actually. Only debit notes issued by the firm and the credit notes issued by the firm are uh, examples of internal evidences. Audit evidence by the audit evidence obtained by the auditor is persuasive as this is the correct option. So they are telling debit notes and credit notes issued by the firm are only internal evidences purchase invoices are external evidence and also they uh, the article assistant thought that audit evidence obtained is final and conclusive which is not actually the evidence obtained by the auditor is only persuasive so they are also telling that yes this is the correct option anyhow read the d point also only debit notes issued by the firm are example of internal evidence no if the credit notes are also issued by the firm only then also it is internal evidence 
so this option is also correct why because not just debit notes even credit notes are also an example of internal evidence so which option is the correct option option c is going to be the correct option clear so with this we are done with the third case scenario also sorry i told there are no general mcqs there are some general mcqs also let us try to cover them cad during the course of CAD during the course of audit of a company which is engaged in the export business notices that credit facilities taken by the company during the year from a bank are 10 crore rupees have almost been fully utilized during the year. The company has taken 10 crores of credit facilities and they have almost fully utilized. On going through sanction letter provided by the bank to the company it is observed that the rate of interest stipulated in the sanction letter is 8%. Financial statements of the company bank of the company show bank interest amounting to 60 lakhs only. Which type of substantive analytical procedures he has performed? He, he he found out what is the amount of the loans taken he found out what is the average interest rate so 10 crores is the amount of loan taken 8 percent is the interest so if you calculate on an average interest amount should have been 80 lakhs but in the books of accounts the uh, the amount of interest was only 60 lakh rupees in the books of accounts the amount of interest was only 60 lakh rupees so he is trying to calculate he is trying to compare the amount of borrowings with the interest rate and he is trying to cross verify whether the interest is correct or not so he is performing analytical procedure but which method he is using this is something called reasonableness test that means in the reasonableness test we will not compare with the previous years we will not study the relationship between two financial items we will take one financial item and will try to compare its relationship with related non-financial item like rate of interest is a non-financial item amount of borrowings is a financial item so we studied the relationship within the same year and found out whether the interest is reasonable or not so we performed here reasonableness test we did not do trend analysis, we did not do ratio analysis, we did not do structural test, we simply verified reasonableness test. We have simply performed what? Reasonableness test we have performed. Understood? Next one. An auditor of the company has found that accountant of a company has entered bogus purchase bills for 50 lakhs in its books of accounts. That means one of the employee has committed a fraud amounting to how much? 50 lakh rupees. Which of the following is the most appropriate regarding auditor's duty as far as reporting is concerned? So what he should do? Since he has involved, since he has found out the amount of fraud, since he has found out the fraud in the company involving amount of 50 crore rupees, which is less than a crore. So tell me what are the reporting requirements? Should he report to central government? No, central government reporting will only become applicable when the amount involved in the fraud is 1 crore or more. So what he will do since the amount involved in the fraud is less than a crore, he will simply report the matter to audit committee or board of directors within 2 days of the knowledge of the fraud. The same thing they will try to say there. Report the matter to jurisdictional ROC. No, this we did not see it anywhere. ROC will not report. Report the matter to secretary MCA. This will be required only when the amount involved is more than 1 crore. Greater than or equal to 1 crore, then only you will report. Report the matter to board of directors. Yes, this is the correct option. Report the matter to ROC as well as GST authority. This was not mentioned anywhere. So, correct option is option number C. Next one. During the course of audit of a company, it is noticed by the auditor that profit before tax of the company is 5 lakhs. Depreciation on building reflected in the schedule of PPE forming part of the financial statements is 10 lakh rupees. But the current amount of depreciation is 25 lakh rupees. The company should have shown actual amount of depreciation as 25 but in the statement of PNL, they have they have shown the depreciation as only 10 lakh rupees this is an example of what misstatement mistake in the financial statements this we call it as misstatement so the above, the above is an example of misstatement understood so these are the mcq part with this we are done with the mcq part now we will proceed further and try to understand the descriptive part of the mtp series 2 so now let us come to the descriptive part so we'll try to understand now descriptive questions as well see here in mtp series 2 the descriptives are the descriptive questions are very interesting and uh, very in-depth questions have been tested so that's why i'm telling you very repeatedly referring this mtp series 2 is very very important for the examination why because the questions have been drafted in an excellent way in a very indirect way in a very complex way they have structured the questions so if you want to become familiar of understanding interpreting the difficult questions in the examination the only way is you have to start solving it you have to start practicing it how you can practice it by way of solving this mtps and rtps so descriptive questions are very good here in this uh, particular mtp series too so let us try to understand this descriptive questions first one sanjeev an articled clerk in an audit firm is a part of the engagement team conducting an audit of a company for financial year 2023-24. It is a small company having a turnover of about 25 crores. During the, cro during the course of the audit, he notices that senior team member has taken following approach for selecting items for testing reflected in the financial statements to obtain audit evidence. So they spoke about certain details. There is a person Sanjeev who is an article clerk of an engagement team member. He is conducting audit of some small company having a turnover of 25 crores. And during the course of the audit, he felt that one of the senior team member has taken some steps, has followed the below mentioned steps for testing of the items of the financial statements. 
Number one, he has selected to test items debited under machinery, repairs and maintenance as expenditure relating to it during the year 2023-24 has increased considerably as compared to the last year. So what he has done is, so he, he thought I will try to verify the machinery and repa machinery repairs and maintenance. So he has decided that he is going to verify machinery repairs and maintenance in a detailed manner. Why? Because in that uh, the expenditure has increased considerably. Okay. So he wanted to verify machinery repair and maintenance in a detailed manner. Next one. Out of purchases, he has selected to test purchases from the related parties that to amounting to 5 crore. So he has decided that out of the purchases, he will specifically verify the purchases from the related parties. Next one, he has also selected to test all individual items of expenditure exceeding 5 lakh rupees. He has also decided whatever expenditure that are exceeding 5 lakh rupees, all that expenditures also he will verify. Besides, he has also selected amount of 0.5 lakhs debited under the head legal expenses to know the purpose of the payment made to the external legal counsel. He has also decided that whatever legal expenses are there, in that legal expenses also, whatever expense which is more than 50,000, that he will verify in a detailed manner to know what is the purpose of the payment. Sanjeev understands that the senior team member is using a audit sampling for selecting items for the testing. So on the basis of the above steps, article assistant has decided that, okay, the senior team member is performing audit sampling for selecting items for testing. Do you agree with him? Which risk is involved in the approach? Discuss with the reasons. So two questions are asking. So article assistant is of the feeling that the above engagement, the above senior team member is performing audit sampling. Is he correct? Is he performing audit sampling? And also, and also they are asking one more question, which risk is involved, which risk is involved in the above methods. See, here I wanted to explain one concept, one small concept I wanted to explain. So that small concept which I wanted to explain is, see, if the auditor wants to verify, so if you are conducting audit for the purpose of obtaining audit evidence, you can do two types of testing, broadly two types. Either you can perform, either you can verify all items, either you can verify all items or you can go for audit sampling or you can go for audit sampling. So broadly, specifically speaking, in order to obtain audit evidence, broadly you can do two things. Either you can go for all items verification, 100% verification you can do. Or you can go for audit sampling. Sir, what do you mean by audit sampling? Audit sampling mainly means I will not perform 100%, I will not perform audit procedures on the 100% of the transactions, but I will try to perform audit procedures on less than 100% of the items in the population. That is, I will try to perform audit procedures on the sample. And I will select the sample in such a manner that every item will have an equal sense of selection. So when I go for audit sampling, what basically I try to do in the audit sampling, I try to verify, I try to perform audit procedures to less than 100% of the items in the population, but I will try to make sure that whatever sample I am selecting, in that, uh, in the process of selecting of sample, each and every item will have an equal sense of selection. But in between, one more thing is there. In between, one more thing is there. So broadly two things, either verify all items or go for sampling. And in between, one more method is there to obtain audit evidence that is, performing selective testing or performing verifying selecting specific items also we say so in between another method is there between 100 percent verification and audit sampling one more method is there which is selecting specific items selecting specific items so in the selection of specific items what will happen is auditor will try to choose a specific item he will not verify on sampling he will not uh, take the items on a sampling basis he will not do that but he will select a specific items to understand certain aspects like for example he might select only high value items to understand are there any mistakes in the high value items or he might take up all together one area one entire area he can decide he will try to understand in a detailed manner like in the question whatever they have told auditor wants to verify machinery repairs and maintenance in a detailed manner or he might understand he might want to observe certain expenditure to understand the nature of the organization to understand the nature of the transactions so when i say selecting specific items that is slightly different from audit sampling there is a thin line of difference between selecting specific item and audit sampling see in the audit sampling what we do is we will have a bigger population from that bigger population a few items we will select that too we will select it in such a manner every item will have equal chance of selection and perform audit procedures on a few sample items but in the case of selecting specific items we will be choosy we will be selecting only specific items in order to under in order to get a broader understanding of the transactions like we will select only high value items we will pick up only one area in that area we will study in a detailed manner we will try to obtain we will try to pick up certain expenses 
to understand the nature of the transactions so that is what we call it as selecting specific items and there is a thin line of difference between selecting specific items and audit sampling in the given case whatever that senior team member is doing that is not audit sampling he is actually doing selective speci selecting specific items and performing the audit procedures on them so there is very thin line of difference between audit sampling and selecting specific items so in the given case the person the senior team member whatever steps we have seen the senior team member is actually trying to perform the selecting of specific items and performing audit procedures and he is not performing audit sampling here so in the given case article assistant is of the feeling that that senior team member is doing audit sampling that is actually wrong he is not doing audit sampling he is doing the selection of specific items okay so the same thing they will try to say that so let us see how the answer has been presented so if you read the answer first they have given the definition to the term audit sampling so audit sampling refers to the application of audit procedures to less than 100 percent of the items in the population in order to draw the conclusions about entire population this we have already seen it in the given situation senior team member is not selecting items for testing by means of audit sampling that is is not following audit sampling he is only selecting specific items from a population so whatever thing which is the senior team member is doing so that we call it as selecting specific items not audit sampling so in accordance with SA 500, one of the means available to the auditor for selecting items for testing is by selecting specific items. Sir, what do you mean by selecting specific items? Specific items selected may include high value or key items. So the auditor may decide to select specific items within a population because they are of very high value or they exhibit some other characteristics. For example, items that are suspicious, unusual, particularly risk prone or that have a history of error. So what you will do is how you will select the specific items is you will look for those items which are of high value or which show certain suspicions or all items over a certain amount or in some cases what you will decide is I, expenditure beyond this certain point I will verify like in the given question one of the senior team member is telling whatever purchases are there from the related parties more than 5 crore rupees that he will verify that means he is choosing a certain uh, certain transactions beyond certain limit next one items to obtain information the auditor may also examine items to obtain information about matters such as nature of the entity or nature of the transaction like if you see here the auditor has decided whatever legal expenses are there which are more than 50,000 rupees that he will verify because he wants to know what is the purpose of the payment so this is what we call it as selecting specific items and how specific items will be selected is on the basis of high value items or items over a certain amount or items to obtain information so therefore sanjeev's understanding is not proper this sanjeev article assistant is feeling that that is audit sampling no that is not actually audit sampling that is selection of specific items see they are also asking one more question what risk is there here what risk is there here nothing but they are indirectly asking you the question is there any sampling risk here See, in the given case, the auditor is not even going for audit sampling. There is no question of sampling risk here. But in the given case, there is a non-sampling risk. That means there is a chance of auditor's opinion going wrong, not because of sampling, but because of performing inappropriate procedures. So if you are choosing these items, that means your opinion can go wrong because of your wrong decisions, not because of your sampling. So indirectly, they are asking you the question, is there a sampling risk in the given case? No, there is no sampling risk in the given case because auditor is not even going for audit sampling only. So in the given case, what risk is involved? In the given case, non-sampling risk is involved. Non-sampling is, risk is the risk that may the risk that auditor may reach an erroneous conclusion for any reason not related to sampling risk, like erroneous conclusion may be reached due to some inappropriate audit procedure understood so two things we have answered we have understood what is selecting specific items and we have also understood what risk has arised in the given case clear now coming to the next question following the extract from schedule number 10 of advances as appearing in the financial statements of a branch of nationalized bank for the year ending 31st of march 2024 so they have given the advances details so the details of advances are bills purchased and discounted 50 cash credits overdrafts and loan payables 150 term loan 75 totally 275 now what is the question in carrying out audit of above advances as a part of statutory audit of a branch a statutory auditor would obtain evidence about certain matters to state those matters nothing but indirectly when you are obtaining audit of advances of a bank what are the matters regarding which you try to obtain audit evidence what things you will try to verify regarding the advances of the bank like we have seen even in our regular discussion we will try to verify whether these loans are authorized or not whether state whether they are stated at the correct amounts or not whether assets are taken for the, as a security or not and also we will try to verify in case of working capital loans whether the all the amounts are within the drawing power and sanction limit or not all the necessary documents have been executed or not loan agreements are properly executed or not so like that we have one question in the audit of banks chapter so what are the audit procedures which we have to perform with regard to advances of a bank so the same thing we will be able to find it in the answer also here so just you can go through it nothing but steps what steps you will perform in order to verify advances so straightforward question you can read it now coming to the next question caj is working as an internal auditor in jkl limited a non-listed company 
The responsibilities of the internal auditor include reviewing financial information and performing test of details, performing performing detailed test on transactions and balances. Okay. Is also responsible for compliance with laws and regulations and external requirements. Okay. First, they told what are the responsibilities of internal auditor. Next one. During the year 2022-23, services of an employee, services of an employee of company were terminated. So one of the employees, one of the employee has been terminated from the company. The said employee has filed a suit against the company. This employee, what he has done is this company has removed me without any proper valid reason. He filed a case against the company. Compensation dues amounting to 10 lakhs, which were not paid to him. He filed a case that company did not pay him the compensation which is due for 10 lakh rupees. Based upon advice of a legal counsel, the company has made a provision of 10 lakhs in the financial statements for the year 2022-23. So legal case is going. So the company has approached a lawyer. They told, okay, sir, you have a chances of losing the case. You do one thing, create a provision of 10 lakh rupees. So management created a provision as on 31st of March of 2023 for this legal case. However, somewhere in June 2023, that means after the balance sheet date, somewhere in June 2023, there is an out of court settlement between the company and employee. So, but after the end of the financial year, what happened is this employee and company both came to a compromise and they settled the case for 6 lakh rupees. That means after the end of the balance sheet, an event has happened, which is a subsequent event and an event happening after the date of balance sheet. So here it is a subsequent event. And as per the accounting standards, we know subsequent events are of two types, adjusting events, non-adjusting events. You tell me, is this event adjusting or non-adjusting? Is it conforming some extra evidence to the conditions which are already existing as on the balance sheet date or it is not conforming any conditions which are existing as on the balance sheet date? So if you pay close attention, there is already a case existing as on the balance sheet date. And that was confirmed after the balance sheet date by way of mutual settlement. So this is a subsequent event and the, uh, this is a subsequent event which confirmed to the conditions which are existing already as on the balance sheet date. So this is an adjusting event. If it is an adjusting event, what is the accounting treatment? The management should have revised the management should have made this adjustment in the financial statements they should not have created the provision for 10 lakhs that would be wrong they have to restate their provision at 6 lakh rupees because it is an adjusting event the statutory order of the the statutory audit of the company is under progress and the audit report has not yet been finalized how the internal auditor should have proceeded in the situation i think but internal auditor means you are a part of the management of the company so they are asking not from the auditor's perspective, not from the stat auditor's perspective. They are, they are asking the question from the management's perspective. You are an internal auditor, part of the management. You came to know there is a subsequent event as an internal auditor, as a part of the management. What is your responsibility? So you have to advise the management to restate the provision. Since it is conforming to the existing conditions existing as on the balance sheet date, provision of 10 lakhs will not be correct. Provision of 6 lakhs only will be correct. You should ask the management to adjust this provisions figure. Clear? So this is not a question relating to standards on audit. Most of the people will often get confused with that. It is a question relating to SA 560. This is not the question relating to SA 560. This is the question relating to accounting standards. Whether it is an adjusting event or non-adjusting event. This is the question regarding that. So same thing you will be able to find it in the answer. Subsequent events are those events which are occurring between the date of the financial statements and the date of the auditor's report and the facts that became known to the auditor after the date of auditor's report. So they have given definition of subsequent events as per SA 560. In the given case, the company had already made a provision of 10 lakh rupees in the financial statements for the financial year 22-23. However, there is, out, there is an out of court settlement between the company and the employee for 6 lakh rupees. It is an example of event which provides evidence of conditions that existed at the date of the financial statements that is 31st of March 2023. It provides evidence on adjustment in provision amount already made in the financial statements. Therefore, internal auditors should ask the management to revise the provision downwards to 6 lakh so that financial statements are in accordance with applicable accounting standards so this is an accounting question that's why i told next one kst limited is engaged in manufacturing business it appoints cat to provide it an assurance report on its financial statements prepared on the basis of historical financial information so the company has approached the uh, the company has approached cat to pro to perform to give some report on historical financial information okay the characteristics of such a population engage such an engagement is that it involves a gathering of sufficient and appropriate audit evidence on the basis of which limited conclusions can be drawn upon by the practitioner identify the type of engagement see i told as a practicing chartered accountant you can do four kinds of engagements number one is audit engagement number one is audit engagement number two is review number three is assurance number four is related services See, assurance is something, assurance engagement is an engagement where you are performing, where you are working on other than other than historical financial information. If you are working on future financial information or if you are working on non-financial information, that will fall under assurance. 
Related services agreed upon procedures. You are not doing any verification work. You are compiling the financial statements, preparing the books of accounts that we call it as related services. So if you are doing any assignment regarding historical financial information, it will either fall under audit, it will fall under review. Any of the chances there. Sir, how to identify whether it is audit or review? See, they say that audit is a reasonable assurance engagement, whereas review is a limited assurance engagement. Whereas, a lim whereas review is a what? Limited assurance engagement. You tell me in the given case, they have told practicing chart accountant is doing, is working with historical information. So it should be either audit or review. What do you think this engagement is? Is it audit or is it review? It is review. Sir, how you are able to make it, how you are able to decide that it is review? Why? Because in the question, they have clearly told he is required to, uh, he is required to form limited conclusions only. He is required to form limited conclusions only. That means he is required to obtain only limited assurance, not reasonable assurance. So in the given case, the type of engagement is review engagement. And they are also asking write two other features of such an engagement. They are also asking you to write some extra features of the review engagements. See, in the case of review engagements, we will perform less, we will obtain less evidence than when compared with the audit. We try to obtain less evidence in the case of review engagements. And also we try to obtain limited assurance, not reasonable assurance. So that other features also they say here, like if we read it as given above, the engagement involves gathering of sufficient appropriate evidence on the basis of which limited conclusions can be drawn up. It is a limited assurance engagement like review. Other two features of such type of engagement are it provides lower level of assurance than the reasonable assurance. Reasonable assurance is a little bit higher level of assurance, whereas review engagement is a limited assurance. And also it performs fewer audit procedures than reasonable assurance engagement. That means than, in, than when compared with the audit in the case of review, we perform less procedures. In the audit, we perform little bit more in-depth audit procedures. Comparatively, we perform less audit procedures in the case of review. Clear? So with this, we are done with the question number one. So now let us talk about question number two. Two A. Written representation about management responsibilities involve confirmation of fulfillment of management responsibilities in the preparation of the financial statements, providing the relevant information and also informing completeness of the transaction. Explain. That means that telling as an auditor, you need to obtain written representation regarding management responsibilities. Explain in a detailed manner. Nothing but when you read the term written representations, immediately the thing which should strike your mind is SA 580. And looking at the question, they are asking you to write about regarding which matters auditor is required to obtain written representation. They told that you have to obtain written representation regarding management responsibilities, which involves fulfillment of management responsibility, which involves confirmation from the management regarding fulfillment of the responsibilities and also completeness of transaction. Explain. That means what indirectly they are asking you. They are indirectly asking you to explain in a detailed manner regarding which matters you will try to obtain written representation. And we have objective paragraph F, we have objectives paragraph of SA 580. So objectives paragraph of SA 580 will tell you regarding which matters you need to obtain written representation. See the question is given for four marks. What you can do is first you write the definition of written representation. What is the meaning of written representation you write? How you can use written representation as a evidence that one paragraph you can write. Then you write the objectives paragraph which will say as an auditor you need to obtain two compulsory written representation that management has fulfilled the responsibility for the preparation of the financial statements that too in accordance with the applicable financial reporting framework. And also as an auditor, you need to obtain written representation whether the management uh, whether management has completely provided the information to the auditor, completeness of information provided to the auditor. So regarding these two matters compulsory, you have to obtain written representation that objectives paragraph you write. So write the meaning of written representation, write the objectives of the right, how written representation can be used as audit evidence, then write the objectives paragraph. Next part, coming to the next part. Planning includes consideration of the timing of certain activities and audit procedures that need to be completed prior to the performance of further audit procedures. Nothing but when you are doing the planning, at the time of planning the audit, you need to consider various factors like what is the timing of activities <clears throat> and what procedures you have to perform that need to be considered while doing the planning. For example, planning includes the need to consider prior to auditors identification and assessment of risk of material misstatement certain matters. That means at the time of planning the audit, you need to identify uh, before you perform the risk assessment procedures also you need to consider various matters discuss those matters so indirectly what is the question is what are the matters which you are required to consider while planning the audit of the financial statements what are the matters which you are required to consider while planning the audit of the financial statements what things you will try to keep in mind while doing the planning First of all, what do you mean by planning of the audit? See, we, we know that the planning of the audit involves three steps, establishing overall audit strategy, establishing audit plan and establishing audit program. The process of developing of this audit strategy, audit plan and audit program, that entire process only we call it as planning. 
So now the question is while planning the audit of the financial statements, what factors you are going to consider? So those factors are given here. So prior to auditor's identification, that means even before you perform the risk assessment procedures, you need to consider the following matters while planning the audit of financial statements. Sir, what matters I have to consider? Analytical procedures, you need to decide how you want to perform risk assessment procedures. Do you want to make use of uh, analytical procedures? Do you want to make use of inquiries? Do you want to make use of inspection and observation? So you have to decide how you are going to perform risk assessment procedures. And specifically, are you going to make use of analytical procedures? And also, before you plan the audit, you need to obtain a general understanding of legal and regulatory framework applicable to the entity and how the entity is complying with that framework. Nothing but try to understand about external environment. You need to determine materiality. You need to determine is there any requirement for involvement of experts, and also you need to determine is there any is there any is there any requirement of performing other risk assessment procedures. So these are the factors you have to keep in mind while doing the planning of the audit. Even prior to risk assessment procedures, these factors you have to consider in the planning of the audit of the financial statements. Clear? Next one. Coming to the next one. In an initial audit engagement, in the case of inventories, the current period's audit procedures on the closing inventory balance provide little audit evidence regarding inventory on hand at the beginning of the period. So when you read this term initial audit engagement, immediately what should strike your mind? SA 510. So this standard is relating to SA 510 initial audit engagements and the opening balances. Therefore, in such a case, additional audit procedures become necessary so that auditor may obtain sufficient and appropriate audit evidence and discuss those additional audit procedures. Nothing but they are telling when you are performing initial audit engagement. That means this is the year you are doing the audit. Last year you did not do the audit. So in the case of initial audit engagements, SA 510 says we need to obtain audit evidence regarding opening balances. Now they are specifically talking about inventory. See inventories also will be there as a part of opening balances. Opening balance of inventories also will be there. So as an auditor, how you will try to obtain audit evidence that this opening balance of the inventory is correct. As an auditor, what audit procedures you will try to perform to obtain audit evidence whether this inventory's opening balance is correct or not, what procedures you will try to perform. So if we have a look at the answer, so they say the same thing. So in an initial audit engagement, in the case of inventories, the current procedures on the audit on the closing inventory balance provide little evidence. See, you will try to obtain audit evidence regarding current year's inventory, current year's closing balance. But by performing audit procedures on the current year's closing balances, you obtain little evidence regarding opening balances. So that's why what you need to do is in order to obtain audit evidence, whether opening balances are correct or not, you need to perform specific audit procedures. What are they? So once again, if I read it in an initial audit engagement, in the case of inventories, the current periods audit procedures on the closing inventory balance provide little audit evidence regarding inventory on hand at the beginning of the period. So when you perform audit procedures on the closing balances, that procedures will give you less evidence regarding opening balances. Therefore, additional audit procedures may be necessary and one or more of the following may provide sufficient appropriate audit evidence regarding opening balance of inventory. In order to obtain audit evidence regarding opening balances of the inventory, what you can do? So what you can do is observing a current physical inventory counting and reconciling it to the opening balance. See what you can do is from the current year's closing balances, you can work out the opening balance. So how you can, how you can do it? What you can do is you can take the closing quantity of inventory as per the current year. To this, you have to add back all the sales whatever made during the current year. During the current year, whatever sales have happened, that you have to add it. From that, you have to reduce whatever purchases you have made in the current year. So if you read up, if you do the calculation, you will get one figure. This figure should match with my opening balances. So like this, if you do the reconciliation with the current year's closing inventory, you can obtain audit evidence whether opening balance is correct or not. Similarly, you can also perform audit procedures on the valuation of the opening inventory items. Similarly, what you can do is you can take the opening balance of inventory. You can try to understand how this, how the value of opening balance has been derived. So what is the quantity used? What is the NRV used? So that you can verify whether this valuation of the opening balance is correct or not. And also you can do some audit procedures regarding gross profit and cutoff. You can try to study the relation, relationship of inventory with the gross profit. You can perform analytical procedures and even you can perform cutoff procedures. Sir, what do you mean by cutoff procedures? Take for example, 22-23 financial year. Opening date is 1-4-2022. So I will see immediately after the balance sheet date. Immediately after the balance sheet date. Take for example, on 2nd of April 2022, I came to know that the inventory was received by the company. The inventory came to the company's premises on 2nd of April. I will try to check since inventory came to the premises only on 2nd of April, it should form part of current year's stock. It should not have gone to the th previous year's balance. It should not have been reflected in the opening balance. Nothing but last year inventory opening balance, whatever is there, that should show inventory only which is existing as on the last year's balance sheet date. So how I can try to do is by performing some cutoff procedures. So these three procedures, if you perform, you can obtain audit evidence regarding opening balances.
able to understand so generally whatever audit procedures you perform on the closing balances that will give a little evidence regarding opening balance of inventory so you need to perform specific procedures to obtain that evidence what you can do is you can do the reconciliation from the closing balances you can check the valuation of the opening inventory and also you can perform some analytical procedures on the gross profit and also you can perform cutoff procedures next one coming to the next question d internal control questionnaire is a comprehensive series of questions concerning internal control as we know that there are four methods for evaluation of internal control what are they narrative record checklist internal control questionnaire and flowchart so they are telling internal control questionnaire is a comprehensive series of questions what will be there in icq in icq series of questions will be there a company is engaged in business of manufacturing of chemicals there is one company which is engaged into the business of chemicals okay uh, it has two plant locations in city a in city a two locations are there and they are having one plant in city b totally three plants are there two are in city a one is in city b involving huge value of assets building at three locations buildings at three locations is owned by the company only the company earns handsome profits and does not want to suffer losses due to business interruptions the company is making good amount of profits they don't want to fall into trouble because of some interruptions so it has decided department for looking after insurance matter so since they don't want to get worried about the issue since they are making decent amount of profits they have set up an insurance department which makes sure that they will take all the insurance policies to protect them against the future losses so as an auditor prepare an internal control questionnaire concerning this department for obtaining staff responses so if you are conducting audits of such an entity what kind of questions in order to know whether internal controls in that insurance department is working effectively or not what kind of questions you will draft what kind of questions you will draft for insurance department of the client so as we know in case of internal control questionnaire the questions will be drafted in such a manner answer is going to be yes no or not applicable so let us see what kind of questions we can ask uh, uh, and what kind of questions we can ask in order to know whether internal controls in the in insurance department are working effectively or not some sample questions are given here are competitive quotes obtained from different insurance so before you take the insurance policy is this insurance department asking quotations from different insurance service providers and choosing the best one which is providing best cover at the best possible price is comprehensive insurance obtained for fire flood burglary earthquake crisis did they take comprehensive policy single policy which will cover all this kind of damages yes or no are all are all three locations are covered see as i have told company is having plants at three places whether all the three locations are insured or not are all assets consisting of building plant and machinery and inventories covered and in that insurance policies also in all the locations also did all the assets got covered is there an adequate procedure to ensure that assets acquired between two renewal dates are also covered for example you are having a policy your, your policy will expire on 31st of january 2022 uh, so you renewed the policy on 1 4 2022 now next policy will renew on 1 4 2023 take for example you took the policy on 1 4 2022 whatever assets which are existing as on 1 4 2022 will be covered but insurance companies will offer one more policy also between these renewal dates if in between before the next renewal also if any asset was acquired even for that asset also they will give the coverage so these kind of policies some insurance companies to order uh, for their premium customers they offer these kind of services also not just that assets which are existing as on the date of the policy before you renew that policy for the next year in between if any assets are acquired on that also cover will be given check whether such kind of coverage is there in the insurance policy is there an official who decides on the value for which policies are taken for which value for what assets or policy is taken is there a concerned person who is authorizing all that does officer who decide on policy value review periodically adequacy of insurance cover is there someone who is reviewing periodically whatever insurance policies you have taken whether they are adequate or not is loss of profits insurance also taken see not just a damage to the assets sometimes you can take insurance policy insurance policies to protect your losses also because of for example if fire accident happened if fire accident happened or not just uh, assets will get damaged even for that fire accident because of that loss even my business also will, inter will get interrupted i will lose my profits also there are insurance companies which will give policy even to protect against the losses also check whether that loss for profits are also taken have there been any instances of rejection of claims previously if you made any claim has it been rejected are any pending claims followed up in the insurance if you have any still pending claim with some insurer are you following up with that uh, pending claims so these are the few questions which i will ask in the internal control questionnaire relating to the insurance department so this is one of the kind of a practical question next one next one ESA Industries Private Limited has prepared its financial statements for the year 2023-24. The financial statements and notes to accounts show the following information and disclosure in respect of trade receivables. So they are giving a disclosure requirements of the trade receivables. So total trade receivables are 240, 240 lakhs and out of that they have some outstanding. So aging analysis they have done. 
so what are due for msme what are due for others disputed msme disputed others less than one year one to two years two to three years more than three years total see this kind of uh, disclosure they have given regarding trade receivable so you are a part of the engagement team conducting audit of the company point out discrepancies including omission in the above disclosure do not prepare another table so they are specifically asking don't prepare another table they are just asking is this a disclosure correct or not no this disclosure is not correct so if you refer to the audit of the items of the financial statements and you, even if you refer the recent summary which i have shared with you recently i have shared the summary with you right so even if you refer to the recent summary whatever i have shared you there i have given one table in which you will in which uh, i have presented what are the disclosure requirements regarding trade receivables so in that trade receivables format will be there so you are required to list out they are asking you don't draw the table just list out the disclosure requirements see actually these disclosure requirements are wrong so what disclosure requirements will be applicable is this disclosure requirement whatever they have given that is applicable for trade payables not trade receivables for trade receivables what will be the disclosure requirements is we will divide it into different categories like uh, disputed uh, let me show you that disclosure requirement that will give you a better understanding so just give me a minute yeah i will anyhow read the answer yeah so the company has wrongly disclosed information for trade receivables because whatever distinct whatever disclosure they have given that is actually for trade payables so disclosure requirements for trade receivables are so you have to divide the trade receivables into these categories undisputed trade receivables considered good undisputed trade receivables considered doubtful disputed trade receivables considered good disputed trade receivables considered doubtful and also whatever aging they have done this aging is also not correct the aging requirements are so those debtors which are for owed you for less than six months six months to one year one to two years two to three years and more than three years and also you can further divide the trade receivables into how many of them are secured and considered good how many of them are unsecured considered good how many are doubtful and even you have to state what is the elements for bad and doubtful debts also should be disclosed and even you have to disclose how many receivables are there from the directors or other officers of the company or uh, either uh, of or any of them either severally or jointly that nothing but how much amount is recoverable from the directors and other officers and how much amount is recoverable from directors and private companies in which a director is a partner or a director is a member nothing but how much amount is recoverable from the related parties that also you have to disclose it separately so the same presentation even if you refer to that summary material of audit of items of financial statements which i have shared recently a table will be there they are asking you not to draw the table they are just asking you to list out so don't draw the table once again why because in the question they have specifically told do not prepare another table they are not asking you to prepare the table just they are going they are just they are asking you to explain is that disclosure correct or not no disclosure is not correct why because this is what the segregation which has to be done this is what the aging which has to be done so you have to explain it in a point wise manner they are asking you specifically not to draw the table just have a look at the table actual disclosure requirement regarding trade receivables from the charts you will get the better clarity okay next one so being a statutory auditor of gel limited a company engaged in manufacturing of chemicals ca gopika has understood that company is expected to have material work in progress as on 31st of march 2024 state few audit procedures to verify existence and valuation of assertion for work in progress so they are asking you what audit procedures you will try to perform whether the work in progress is correct or not so here you can write the procedures from SA 501 as well. So if you want to know whether work in progress is correct or not, first what you can do is you can attend the inventory counting process. Whenever inventory is getting counted, you can go and attend that inventory counting process. From there, you will come to know whether really work in progress is there in existence or not. And the, for the purpose of determining what should be the valuation of work in progress, determine is there any expert needed. If required, take the help of the expert. As a time, how various stages of production or value additions are measured. So in case of work in progress, we have to determine what is the percentage of completion. So you need to understand how that stages of completion has been calculated, on what basis it has been calculated. And also you should ascertain what costs are added to that work in progress, which kind of overheads are added. And also uh, see the same thing they say, ascertain what elements of cost are included. If overheads are included, ascertain the basis on which they are included, on what basis you have allocated, or what is the recovery rate, costing you would have done all this. And compare such basis with available costing and financial data. And also see that if any abnormal costs are there, that should not be included in the valuation abnormal cost should not be included so ensure that material cost exclude any abnormal wastages so these are the few audit procedures which you can perform in order to obtain audit evidence regarding work in progress next one see the ascertaining of reporting objectives of engagement help the auditor of plan to plan time of different timing of different audit procedures and also nature of communications give three instances to explain see this is a very indirect question they are asking you you need to ascertain reporting objectives of the engagement and also you need to understand the nature of communication do you find this is sounding familiar somewhere 
See, one of the factor which you have to consider in establishment of audit strategies, the second factor which you have to consider in establishing audit strategies, what are the reporting objectives of the engagement? So, indirectly they are asking you, what are the examples of reporting objectives which you will try to understand? If I show you specifically, see, they are asking you, give three instances to explain the reporting objectives. So, if I have to show you where that question is there in the material. So, if you see here, this is the first question on audit strategy planning and program. So, one of the factor which you have to consider in establishing overall audit strategies is, see here, reporting objectives of the engagement and also nature of communication required. So, they are asking you, give some examples of reporting objectives and nature of communications. That means, what you need to understand regarding reporting objectives, what information you try to get regarding nature of communication. So, examples also I have given you, the same three examples you have to write it there. Introduce timetable for reporting, organization of meetings with the management, discussion with the management, with those charged with guidance regarding the expected type and timing of the reports. So, this we have discussed in a detailed manner in order strategy planning and program. So, just to this paragraph you have to write. See how tricky the question is. How tricky the question is. Nowhere they use the term audit strategy. That's why I told in this particular MTB the questions are very very complex. So, they know where they use the term audit strategy, but they are very successful in asking a question from the audit strategy that to not a complete question, one specific point they have taken and posed a question out of it. Clear? Next one. One of the factors affecting the form, content and extent of audit documentation relates to size and complexity of the audit. State six other factors in this present. Very direct question. What are the factors which will affect the form, content and extent of audit documentation? So, you have to write that factors that we have already read in the audit documentation chapter. Nature of audit procedures, risk of material misstatement, significance of the evidence, nature of exceptions, the need to document or the basis for conclusion and audit methodology and tools used. Direct question. What are the factors that affect form and content of extent documentation? Next one. It is important to carry out the test of controls for checking effectiveness of internal control over sales as a part of DETAR's audit procedure. In above context, state the points which need to be considered in respect of trade receivables. Nothing but when you are verifying trade receivables, what kind of controls you need to verify. This is a question from audit of items of the financial statements. You will find one question, how to conduct audit of trade receivables. In that first paragraph, we will be there talking about what kind of internal controls should be there generally to ensure that trade receivables are not misstated. So, some kind of internal controls examples they are asking. So, what kind of internal control should be there with regard to trade receivables? Only bona fide sales lead to trade receivables. Only genuine sales are leading to trade receivables. All such sales are made to approved customers. You are making credit sales only to approved customers. All such sales are properly recorded. Once recorded, the data can be settled only by receipt of the cash or writing off. And for writing off, you need, you need authorization of responsible official. And there should be proper segregation of duties at each and every point in the entire sale transaction. Ensure that data are collected on time. In case data are not getting collected, you have to send the reminders and balances should be regularly viewed and there should be proper system of follow-up. So, these are the few internal controls which you should have over sales to make sure that trade receivables are not getting misstated. So, internal controls you are supposed to write here. Next one. Messrs. SR and Associates are the statutory auditors of Vani Textile and Garments Limited, a company engaged in the business of manufacturing of various textile products. Okay. The auditor has completed the audit and is in the and is in the process of forming an opinion on the financial statements for the financial year 2023-24. CAS, the engagement partner, wants to conclude whether the financial statements as a whole are free from material misstatements, whether due to fraud. Guide him about the factors he should consider to reach the conclusion. This question is from SA 700. Before you form an opinion on the financial statements, what factors you will consider? So, if you go to audit reporting chapter, if you go to audit reporting chapter, see here. Hmm. See, see the audit reporting chapter. See, here we have told. So, as an auditor, before you form an opinion, what factors you have to consider? So, as we know, we have to check whether the financial statements are prepared as per applicable financial reporting framework and also whether the financial statements are free from material misstatements and you should consider whether you have obtained sufficient and appropriate audit evidence, whether uncorrected misstatements are material and evaluations. And you have to do two kinds of evaluations. You have to do qualitative aspects evaluation. You have to do specific evaluations. No need to list out all this qualitative and specific. Just write that you are required to do specific evaluations. So, this is what the answer. So, direct question, what are the factors which you are required to consider to form an opinion? So, this we have to write it there. Next one. Coming to the next question. Nature of financial reporting. Next question is a direct question. Nature of financial reporting is itself is one of the causes of inherent limitations. Explain. 
so they are asking you to write how nature of financial reporting itself is an inherent limitation so this question i think you should all have mugged up generally you should not do you have to understand the concept but this is an inherent limitation straightforward question so they are asking you to explain about inherent limitation as uh, how to how to, uh, they are asking you to explain how nature of financial reporting is an inherent limitation so you need not reproduce entire answer just that relevant part of the question you have to write so this is there no nature of financial reporting only this paragraph you have to write so how nature of financial reporting is an inherent limitation so generally management will while preparing the financial statements they make use of various assumptions and judgments and these assumptions and judgments can go wrong in the future when they go wrong in the future even the financial statements also will go wrong and these judgments always involve degree of uncertainty so this paragraph i have told you in a summary this in a detailed manner you have to write it next one let us come to the next part next question next question is also a direct question discuss the objective of the auditor as per essay 705 so if you open essay 705 first paragraph will be objectives of the essay 705 when you will give modified opinion so when we will give modified opinion when we are uh, when we have concluded when we have performed audit procedures we have obtained audit evidence and concluded that financial statements are not free from material misstatements and also we are unable to obtain sufficient and appropriate audit evidence whether the financial statements are free from material misstatements nothing but simply definition of modified opinion so that's what even i have uh, given in my material if they ask you objectives of the auditor as per essay 705 if they ask you definition of modified opinion even if they ask you what are the circumstances in which auditor will give modified opinion for all these questions the answer is going to remain the same okay next one next one next one 5a very tricky question easy question see if you apply the mind in these kind of questions see if you see in mtp also this kind of question is there but that question is from audit in an automated environment similar kind of question has been tested for audit of banks so if you could apply if you could think see here where the conceptual clarity comes into picture if you apply the concept you can easily score this four marks i'm telling you see here column a describe description of certain matters used in banking industry complete column b by suggesting the appropriate term to the description given so they are giving certain description we have to name that term audit of borrower client of bank carried out at the bank's request to verify the borrower's current assets that means bank want to verify borrower's current assets basically stock so on behalf of the banker you are going and verifying the current assets of the borrower what do we, what do we call this stock audit we call it on behalf of the bank if someone is going and auditing the current assets of the borrower current assets means basically stock only will be there so what we are doing there we are doing stock audit so the term used for that is stock audit limit up to which an entity can withdraw from the sanctioned working capital what we call it drawing power we call it statutory right of a creditor to adjust debit balance in debtor's account against any credit balance lying in another account of the debtor one of the modes of creation of security you can adjust the credit balance again as a debit balance what do we call it set off we call it creation of security in a bank branch by mere delivery of title deeds immobile properties we create mortgage in the mortgage also two things will be there registered mortgage equitable mortgage in the registered mortgage we register the property in the name of the bar in the name of the lender but in the case of equitable mortgage we just hand over the original title documents of the property so they are telling creation of security by mere delivery of title deeds this is what equitable mortgage this is what equitable mortgage so they have described an activity you are supposed to name the term clear so this is what i am telling if you apply a proper mind easily you can score the marks next one next question easy question obtaining an understanding of the entity and its environment including an entity's internal control is a continuous and dynamic process of gathering updating analyzing the information so understanding an entity is a continuous process the understanding establishes a frame of reference within which the auditor plans the audit and exercises professional judgment throughout the audit state few areas in which such an understanding is helpful to the auditor nothing but indirectly if you read the last question they are asking how understanding an entity will help the auditor what are the benefits of understanding of entity we have a question in the risk assessment and internal control chapters I, if i am not wrong third question it will be so what are the advantages of what are the benefits of understanding of what are the benefits of understanding of uh, what are the benefits of understanding of the client so you can ascertain risk of material misstatement by understanding the client's business you can understand what is the risk of material misstatement it will help you to determine materiality also even you can decide whatever accounting policies which your client has applied are they appropriate and you will come to know in which areas require special consideration you can also develop expectations while performing analytical procedures and also you can evaluate whether sufficiency and appropriateness of audit evidence is there or not clear everybody so this is what regarding 5b let us come to the next question you are auditor of a college running different courses operating in your city 
during the audit of during the audit of a year it is noticed that fee concessions to students have been provided in a substantial number of cases discuss how you as an auditor would proceed to verify the same and also explain two other points to verify the fee from the students direct question as an auditor how you will try to verify fee from students in the case of educational institution so if you remember in the this is a question from audit of various entities in the audit of various entities you will be able to find how to conduct audit of educational institution in that also they are not asking you about entire points they are only asking you how you will try to verify the fee from students okay so that is a straightforward question i think uh, you can directly read it from the answer next one the auditor shall agree the terms of the audit engagement with management or those charged with guidance as appropriate the agreed terms of the audit engagement shall be recorded in an audit engagement letter or other suitable form of written engage, written agreement who gives the engagement letter and what is included in the engagement letter nature object and scope of audit who will give the engagement letter auditor will give or management will give it is a responsibility of the auditor to prepare the engagement letter and give it to the management and what are the contents of the engagement letter see contents of the engagement letter also you might have already covered it so what are the contents of the engagement letter it should contain objective and scope of the audit it should contain responsibilities of the auditor it should contain responsibilities of the management identification of the applicable financial reporting framework even you have to give reference to the expected form and content of the auditor's report so these are the contents of the audit report which you have seen in the chapter nature objective and scope of audit straightforward question very easy question next one 6a Auditor of Sunshine Limited is of the view that due to greater management intervention to specify accounting treatment, the risk of material misstatement is greater for significant non-routine transactions. So, auditor felt that when there are non-routine transactions, the risk of material misstatement is very high. Is view of the auditor correct? 100%. When there are more non, when there are more non-routine transactions, the risk is obviously very high. Specify other matters due to which risk of material misstatement is greater for significant non-routine transactions. We will have one question in our material in the chapter risk assessment and internal control. Examples of non-routine examples of non-routine transactions where the risk of material misstatement will be high. The same paragraph you will be able to find it here. Four examples we have given. So risk of material misstatement may be greater for significant non-routine transactions such as greater management intervention to specify the accounting treatment. Management should not participate overly in the accounting treatment. That you have to leave it to the finance team. If the management is trying to intervene in the accounting system, that means it is a non-routine transaction that the risk is higher. Greater manual intervention for data collection and processing. When data collection and processing can happen through the systems, there is more manual intervention. When more manual intervention is happening, that means they are trying to manipulate something. Risk is high. Complex calculations are accounting principles. When you came to know the transactions are very complex and accounting principles are also very complex, the risk is very high. The nature of non-routine transactions which may make it difficult for the entity to effectively implement the controls. If you find there are certain areas where it is very difficult to implement internal controls, that is also a greater risk area. Clear? Next one. Coming to the next question. On reviewing internal control or accounting for sales as a part of statutory auditor of A Limited, Auditor finds certain deficiencies in the segregation of duties, authorization of sales order, preparation of invoices, preparation and authorization of director, debit or credit notes and non-following of standard procedures as stipulated by the management. The auditor finds these lapses to be significant deficiencies in the internal control over sales. The moment you find significant deficiency, this question is from SA 265, communicating deficiencies uh, in the internal controls to the management and those charged with guidance. So auditor has verified internal control over sales. He found so many lapses. He decided that it is a significant deficiency. He points it out to the management in one line as under instruction on internal control related to sales are not properly followed is the communication proper so auditor found a significant deficiency he has to report it to the management also he has to report it to the those charged with guidance also here what auditor has done is in one single line he has reported what he has told internal controls are not followed in the sales area is that reporting enough no why because sa 265 says that if you find any significant deficiency you have to report you should not just only communicate significant deficiencies you should also describe them and also explain what are their potential effects and you should give sufficient information to enable the those charged with governance and management to understand the context of the communication it will not be enough just if you report the deficiency you have to describe them you have to tell the potential effects and also you have to tell them and also you have to provide some extra information which will make them to understand that information in a better way therefore the above communication is not proper whatever communication auditor has given that is not proper not only significant deficiency has to be communicated it should also be explained to the management what are the potential effects of not following the standard instructions related to various aspects of the sale it should also explain that such a significant deficiency can lead to misstatement of revenue and trade receivables impact on the profits of the company and also highlighting importance of such control it could it should be stated that responsibility be fixed for concerned persons for adhering to such important control 
nothing but you have to give them what is the deficiency what is the impact of the deficiency what are the controls uh, what is the inf uh, you have to provide some extra information also which will help them to understand the control understand the deficiencies in a better way but in the given question he is just reporting in one line that will not be enough detailed information has to be reported so that's why communication is not proper next one audit against proprietary seeks to ensure that expenditure conforms to a certain principles which have for long been recognized as standards for financial proprietary explain those principles this is from government audit chapter they are explaining to write about proprietary audit how you can decide whether there is a proprietary in the expenditure or not so some general principles are there like expenditure should not be prima facie more than what more than what the occasion demands every public officer is expe is expected to have the same kind of uh, same kind of carefulness like the way he will spend the money from his own pocket no authority should should uh, should sanction the expenditure which is directly or indirectly is benefited by him Public money should not be utilized for the benefit of only one particular person or community unless the amount is insignificant, unless there is unless that claim could be enforced in the court of law, or the expenditure is in pursuance of some recognized policy or custom. And also amount of allowances should be like only helping hand, they should not become a source of profits to the recipients. So from the government audit, uh, direct question they have asked. Next one. Mm, this one. The auditor needs to direct efforts of the management team towards matters that in his professional judgment are significant. Preliminary identification of material classes of transactions, account balances and disclosure helps in establishing overall audit strategy. More energy is needed to be devoted to significant matters to obtain desired outcomes. Give three examples to the above situation. So nothing but they are telling while establishing audit strategy, you have to pay attention to the significant matters. They are asking you to give three examples of significant matters which you will consider while establishing overall audit strategy. See, this is also one, one indirect question. See, from the same question, they have asked two sub questions. This question is also related to that factors to be considered in establishing audit strategy only. So, if you look at this, if you look at the same question, from the same question, they have asked two sub questions. From the same concept, they have asked two questions. So, that's why I'm telling you this time, audit strategy, planning, and program, you have to mug it up. You have to completely understand the constant content and also you have to pay attention to each and every point. Very, very important see how many questions are getting asked from the audit strategy planning and program first so just i wanted to show you that part where are you come fast Audit in an automated environment. Come fast, come fast, come fast. Yeah, see here. So if you see here, this is a third point. In one question, they have asked the second point. Now in one question, they are asking the third point. So if you read this line, the auditor should consider the factors that in the auditor's professional judgment are significant in directing the engagement team's efforts. So what are the examples of that matters which will which will be important in directing the engagement team efforts? That only they are asking. They are asking you to write the three examples. These three examples you have to write there. That itself is the answer. See here, from the same concept, they have asked two questions. Able to understand. So once again, if I read the question, the auditor needs to direct engagement team's efforts towards matters that are significant. The same thing that point also says, you have to consider certain matters in order to direct your efforts. Now they give an extra line to confuse some irrelevant content they have given. Preliminary identification of material classes of transactions, account balances and disclosure help the auditor in establishing audit strategy. So if you, if you identify what are material transactions, material balances, material uh, disclosures you can establish the better audit strategy more energies need to be devoted to significant matters to obtain the desired outcome give the examples of that significant significant matters which we you will consider which you will consider in directing the engagement team's efforts so just you have to write that examples whatever is there next one next question see ravi patnaik is conducting audit of a company for which reporting requirements under car are applicable he finds that cash credit facilities amounting to 4 crores. Cash credit facility means short term loans of 4 crores were released to the company by a branch of a bank for meeting its working capital requirements. He finds that out of the above funds, 1 crore have been used by the company for installing effluent treatment, installing a plant long term purpose to meet the state pollution control board requirements. Is there any reporting obligation upon him under CARO? See, there is a ninth point regarding repayment of the loans in that they say one specific point under CARO. If the company has taken short term loans, but they have used it for long term purposes, you have to comment. The same thing happened here. The company has got a cash credit loan for 4 crore rupees, but they used it for installing a plan. That means short term loans were used for long term purposes. You have to give a negative comment for that point under, under CARO clause number 9. The same thing they say here. 
So clause nine, uh, uh, clause nine, uh, sub clause D of CARO 2020 says whether further, whether funds are raised on short term basis have been utilized for long term purposes. If yes, nature and amount to be indicated. In the given case, funds have been raised for meeting working capital requirements of 4 crore. Cash credit facilities for meeting working capital requirements are by their very nature short term borrowings. Out of the above, 1 crore have been used by the company for long term purposes. Hence, the matter needs to be reported in the CARO in accordance with clause number 9, sub clause D of CARO 2020. Clear? So, this is an easy question. So, that's all, guys. This is regarding MTP2. And as I have told, the questions are a little bit complex here, descriptive questions. So, that's why my humble suggestion don't go for the examination without referring this to MTP series okay so very soon i think by tomorrow I, or by tomorrow also i will release the rtp video also please do refer to that rtp also before you go for the examination okay so that's all for now see you in the next class bye everybody take care